passage is a window looking back into a world that had spiritually and morally lost its way. In fact, there's really no other way to state it than it was a time of just outright confusion, moral and spiritual confusion and anarchy, because there was no real authority in the land except every man being his own authority. You know, we sort of live in a time where people resist authority. Uh, they want to be very autonomous and don't want to account to anybody or be told by anybody what to do. Uh, but you know, the fact of the matter is, some authority is necessary within our life. And if we don't respect authority, that especially the authority that God has set over us, uh, we're going to find ourselves getting in trouble. And that's what happened back here in this ancient time among God's people. Now, you'll notice that the Bible, and this little phrase occurs throughout the book of Judges, it's sort of the keynote of Judges, when it says that in those days every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, you'll notice that that phrase does not say that every man did what was wrong in his own eyes. Uh, this was not a case of people just intentionally setting out to rebel against God and do the opposite of what God had said. Rather, this was a case of spiritual drifting and decay that had brought them to the point that they were so confused and their values were so upside down that what they were doing was very, very wrong, but they thought as they were doing it that what they were doing was right in the eyes, uh, in their own eyes, and thus the eyes of the Lord. And that's the real problem. They thought what was right in their own eyes must be right in the eyes of God. Uh, they had ended up drifting away and ultimately rejecting the law of Moses as the standard of conduct and worship, and the result was moral and spiritual decisions were being made on the basis of subjective whims. In other words, what's right for you is right for you, and what's right for me is right for me. And every man established principles of righteousness on the basis of his own thinking and his own evaluation. And the book of Judges shows us how that type of philosophy led to this state of confusion and spiritual conflict among the tribes of Israel. Well, I doubt if I have to tell you today, if you're very observant of the world around us, that the same philosophy that ruled that day is ruling our own day. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. If truth even exists, well, then truth is merely whatever truth is to you. Truth is what you say that it is. You have your truth, and I have my truth, or these people over here have their truth, but they have no right to hold that over this group as being as though it should be their truth. And that's the postmodern age in which we're living. And uh, that philosophy has been building for a long time now. Over 100 years ago, we dealt with modernism. Modernism, uh, you had higher criticism, you had all of these uh, scholars and all of these supposedly very intellectual and intelligent people who began to question the truthfulness and the veracity of Scripture. They began to question whether or not the miracles recorded in Scripture ever happened, whether Jesus was actually divine, whether he really did those miracles and resurrected from the dead. And so, you know, they began to try to explain Scripture in such a way that all of that could be done away with. And they undermined people's faith in the truth of God's Word. And there were great debates over these subjects, such as the deity of Jesus and the resurrection and the historicity of miracles and all of these things. But, you know, those debates don't rage today like they once did. Doctrinal debates over what the scriptures say and what the scriptures teach, uh, those don't really rage in our uh, communities and in our religious world today. You know why? Because now we've reached the point that it really doesn't matter what you believe. People don't have any convictions about doctrinal matters and so forth. And we're living in the postmodern age where there really is no such thing as absolute truth. That is truth that applies to everybody. Truth that applies for every age. Truth that does not change and is the absolute standard and the absolute authority. In fact, according to some polling that was taken by the Barna Group, a religious uh, group back in 2009, and keep in mind this is a little dated, they said that only one-third, 34% of people, and this is a survey taken among religious people, only 34% believed in absolute moral truth. In other words, 
you know, there's just some gray area, and there's some room for personal interpretation and for personal experience in determining some standard of right and wrong. Uh, just half of all self-identified Christians firmly believe that the Bible is totally accurate and historically accurate in all of, and not just the facts, but the principles that it teaches. In other words, you really just can't trust the Bible to be an up-to-date and relevant book to modern man. In an even later survey taken in 2012, 31% believe that the Bible can and should be taken literally. Folks, that was 10 years ago. Can you imagine where we are now? And you know what those numbers reveal to us is that we are a generation that has long been adrift without chart and without compass. And I'm convinced that were the prophet Samuel to live today, and if he were to write a history of our land and our culture in this time, as he did the history of the pre-monarchical Jews, he might uh, use the very same words. And every man did what was right in his own eyes. Now Samuel not only tells us that that's the way things were in the days of the judges, he draws a very vivid picture throughout the book of Judges, and particularly right here in this story, uh, of what he means by every man doing what was right in his own eyes. In other words, he shows us the result of this philosophy. And I want us to look at the story and just see how these people were living and how they were thinking because they were doing what was right in their own eyes. And first of all, I want to point out that because they were doing what was right in their own eyes, you had families completely without foundations. Families without foundations. Now, we just read a story that took place within a family. This man, Micah, had taken, he'd just gone in and stolen 1,100 shekels of silver from his mother, who evidently was uh, somewhat wealthy. He goes in and he steals the money from his mother. Uh, and, and, you know, that's bad enough, but I don't guess it's unimaginable. We hear about things like that in the news today. It's not unimaginable that somebody might take advantage of an elderly parent or steal even from their own flesh and blood. Uh, that's bad enough. But folks, if it were only just that, he steals from his mother. And she comes to realize that the money is gone. And she doesn't know who the thief was. She just knows that her money is missing. And she's upset about this. And the Bible says that she pronounced a curse upon whoever the thief was. Well, word got out. Little Micah found out that Mama was on the warpath. And so he thought, I'd better make this all, I'd better straighten all this up. I better bring this money back to my mother. And so he brings the money back to his mother, and a very, very strange encounter takes place. You would think that she would be disappointed in him. You would think that she would feel betrayed by him. You would think that maybe she would be angry with him and scold him for what he had done, but not at all. What did she say? She said, blessed are you. I'm happy you brought this money back. I mean, never mind the fact you came in and stole it from me. I'm just glad you brought the money back because I had a very special purpose for this money. And now get this. She said, I was going to give that money. I had dedicated that money to the Lord. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? I had dedicated that money to God. Now, again, we're talking about people here who, if they lived today, they'd be members of the church. We're talking about people who were part of the nation of God's people. And she said, I had dedicated this money unto the Lord. But how had she dedicated that money to the Lord? She said, I was going to take this money and I was going to make an image out of it. I was going to take this money and make an idol. Now, folks, there's nothing more offensive to God than idolatry. I mean, it's the very first commandment. There's nothing that angers God more than the sin of idolatry. And here you have a woman among God's people who her son is stealing from her. He brings the money back. She's relieved because now she can carry through her plan to give the money to God by making an idol. That's just unimaginable to me, but that's what was going on here. And so uh, she wants to give the money. There's this back and forth between him and her about who's going to take the money. And finally, she just takes a big portion of this money, and she goes down here to the founder, and she has him make an idol, and she gives this idol to her son Micah. And he takes it home, and he just puts it up on his shelf with all of his other carved images and idols, and he has himself yet another brand new religion 
in his house. This was not the introduction of idolatry. They were already steeped in idolatry. He's just adding one more. That's the way idolatry is, of course. And so he just puts this God up here on his shelf in this prominent place in his house with all of the others. And then he gets to thinking, now that I've got this new religion, well, I need a priest to officiate over all of this. I need somebody who can come in and manage this and administrate over this new religion. And so he looked around a little bit. He just, for the time being, appoints his own son to fill that role. Now that story just leaves us scratching our heads. Whatever it is, it is pure, unmitigated, moral, and spiritual confusion. A son stealing from his mother, money she intended to use to make an idol, to dedicate to Jehovah God, who abhors idols. And here's a family in all of this who claims to be serving God. They were doing what was right in their own eyes. Coveting, stealing, cursing, blessing, uh, all of these things, idolatry, all in the name of serving the Lord. Now, as outlandish as that sounds to us, you know, let's stop and think for a second. Really, that's what's going on today. You have everything imaginable being practiced today in the name of religion. You have all kinds of things. You have all kinds of lifestyles today that are being promoted and glorified and incorporated into religion. And, and uh, it's being woven into the fabric of various religions. So really, this is nothing new, as strange as it was. Uh, what we see going on is nothing new. And back then, uh, it was much like what we would have going on in our world today. You know, folks, it's not that we don't have religion in our world. I know we are becoming a more secular society, it seems like. But don't get to thinking that religion is disappearing. It's not that religion is disappearing. It's just that our culture is changing religions. Religion is not disappearing. Our culture is saturated in religion. All kinds of religion. There are all sorts of, of uh, Eastern religions, for example, that permeate our society. It's not that we don't have religion. We have a lot of religion. We're drowning in it. The problem is we don't have Bible truth. We don't have Bible authority. And the real tragedy is that lack of values, that slippery slope, begins today just where it took place right here in this story. And that is in the home. You had a home that was morally and spiritually confused and that led to a nation being turned upside down as well. Uh, I read a story many, many years ago that took place in Missouri. And uh, there were two boys who were out playing one day and this little puppy wandered up. He was a cute little puppy. He was a solid black dog, except he had this conspicuous white spot on his tail. And it was a playful little thing, and the boys just immediately took up with it, and they decided they would take it home, and they would ask their preacher, Daddy, if they could keep this dog. Well, he said, I don't see why not. And they took him in, and they grew quite fond of the dog over the next few days, and then word got out that there was a family that had moved to the area who was missing the dog. And they had sent out word to be on the lookout for this dog. Well, those boys heard about that. They described the dog. When those boys heard that, they took that dog out to the barn, and they got some black paint or black shoe polish, something like that, and they covered up that big white spot on that dog's tail, thinking nobody would recognize it. Well, after a little while, this family comes by. They're just going out looking for their dog, and they come out and knock on the door. The daddy comes out, and he says, uh, yes, what can I do for him? They said, we're looking for our dog, and they described him. They said, he's a black dog with a white spot on his tail, and uh, have you seen him? And he said, oh, no, no dog like that around here. And that little puppy had wandered out across the way, and they said, well, that looks like our dog. He said, no, you said your dog has a white tail. That dog has an all-white tail, can't you see? And they, well, can't argue with that, so they went on their way. Now, when I tell you the names of those two boys, you'll recognize them. Their names were Frank and Jesse James, two of the most notorious criminals in American history, who had a preacher, Daddy, who was evidently more interested in keeping a dog and making his boys happy than he was keeping his boys in the straight and narrow. Now, that's really not an extreme example because our society today is filled with parents, and unfortunately, from time to time, you see it in the church. Parents who are raising their sons and daughters to tell a little white lie here and there, to fudge the truth when it's convenient, 
keep you out of trouble. There are moms and dads raising their kids to bend the rules here and there. Maybe tell them that you're not 12 or 13 yet, so we can get into the theme park a little cheaper, or we can get the uh, we can order off the kids' menu at the restaurant. And you know that doesn't seem so harmful, but it's very harmful. Not only is it wrong, but you're setting a precedent with those children. Because it moves from what you might think of as little things eventually to larger things. And there are parents who are setting examples of immorality and dishonesty and deceitfulness and contempt for rules and contempt for authority. And we are a society that is just like them on a slippery slope because we have families without godly and biblical foundations. But I want you to see something else that was taking place here. You not only had families without foundations, you had preachers without principles. Preachers without principles. Now I want to introduce a new character to the story. Read on in verse 9. The Bible, or verse 7 rather. The Bible says, Now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah. He was a Levite, and he was staying there. Now, when you hear the word Levite, you know your Old Testament. Uh, what does that bring to mind? Well, a priest. Uh, the, the tribe of Levi, that was the priestly tribe. And so this man, if he was not before this time, if he had not already been made a priest, he would have been a temple worker of some kind, probably. Uh, he would have assisted in the services of the temple and so on and so forth. And so for our purposes tonight, we'll just call him a preacher. That's not exactly what he was. But you know, for our purposes, uh, we'll just translate that. We'll say that he was a preacher of that day. And so it introduces us to him saying that he, verse 9, had departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. Now that means he's out looking to make his way in the world. Uh, he needs to go out and find some employment. He needs to find a way to feed himself and clothe himself. He needs a job, just like everybody uh, needs a job at some point. They need to uh, have a way to survive. And he's out looking for such an arrangement. And it says, then he came to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. Now, we just met Micah, the thief, the idolater. He came to the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? So he said to him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I am on my way to find a place to stay. Let me tell you, when he said that, Micah just rubs his hands together, and he thinks, oh, boy. All he needed to hear was, I've got a Levite here, because just like it might bring to your mind a priest, it brought to Micah's mind a priest. And what was he looking for not very long ago? He was looking for a priest to come into his house and to, uh, and to uh, administer all of this idolatrous religion. And so when he says, I'm a Levite, and I'm out looking for a place to stay, Micah says, buddy, have I got a deal for you? Is this not your lucky day? You have shown up at the right place. And listen to what he says in verse 10. He says, dwell with me and be a father and a priest to me. And I will give you 10 shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes and your sustenance. And so the Levite went in. Well, that's hard to turn down. He said, I'll give you a generous salary. I'll give you fine clothes to wear. I will feed you. Uh, you won't want for food. You just come in and work for me in my house, and I will take care of you. And the Bible says that he went in. Now, why is that? Because he is out simply looking for a job. And somebody offered him a job on the right terms, and he says, deal. Deal. And so the Bible says that he hired him to be his own priest. He hired him. Here's a man of God for money going in to be the appointed priest of an idolater and a wicked man purely for a job. You see, he had no real convictions. He really didn't have a spiritual compass. He didn't live by principle. Here was a man who was hired to do a job. In fact, listen to the man in the next chapter in Judges 18 and verse 4. And we'll get more into this part of the story a little later. But uh, he encounters some others. And they ask him what he's doing there. And he tells them, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. 
Folks, he was not a priest with principles. He was a professional preacher, and that's all there was to it. He was a hireling. And you remember what Jesus said about a hireling one time in John chapter 10? He said, the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling, and he careth not for the sheep. He's in it for himself. He's not in it to do the will of God. He's not in it because he cares about the sheep that he's uh, agreed to tend and to care for. He's in it for himself. He's in it for a paycheck. It's a job to him. And being a hireling, he told the people what they wanted to hear. Now, I'll tell you something. That's one of the reasons that we are in the shape that we are in, spiritually, morally, and otherwise, as a culture today. As I said, we're a religious culture. We've been a religious culture for a long, long time. There are many, many preachers. You can't lack for finding preachers in this society today. Somebody who will preach to you. Somebody who will assume spiritual oversight and, and care for you. Uh, our society is full of people that claim to be such and to do such. But you know what the problem is? There are too many prophets for profit. And there are too many preachers after a paycheck and not enough preachers who work for God instead of a church. Now, I, want to, I don't want to be misunderstood here. I am not saying that a preacher is not accountable to a church that supports him. I'm not saying that a, that a church should not support a preacher. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, the Bible commands the church to support the preacher. The Bible says that we're not to muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. The Bible teaches that if a man preaches the gospel, he can live in the gospel. And a church has, I believe, a responsibility to support a faithful man in preaching the gospel. And I think a church ought to support him as well as they can. I think a church ought to, uh, ought to take care of him and make sure that his needs in life are met and he doesn't have to go without and so forth. I'm not against paying a preacher. That's very biblical. And I'm not saying that a man that takes support from that congregation is not accountable to them. If he agrees, I'm going to come in and I'm going to work with you as a congregation. I'm going to do this and that and the other. He needs to be a man of his word and integrity and honest. And he needs to do what he says he'll do. And he needs to be open to just and rightful criticism that may arise. I'm not saying he's not accountable. But I want to give you a warning. Whenever you hear of a church that starts to look around and they start to talk like this, you know what we need? We need to find and hire us a preacher. We need to look out and see if we can find us and hire us a preacher to come in here. Or you have a preacher who begins to talk like, well, what I need to do is go out and find me a preaching job somewhere. I think when you start talking like that, I think you are asking for trouble. You are setting up a very, very disturbing situation. Because sometimes when preachers go out looking for a job and churches start looking for a man to hire, it, comes, it becomes a matter of a man more doing the will of the church than doing the will of the Lord. He answers to God. Now you know when the church supports a man, I want you to keep in mind the church is not supporting the man to do its bidding. And the church is not supporting a man because he's faithful to them. A church supports a man because he's faithful to the Lord. And he's faithful in carrying out his duty and preaching the gospel. And doing the things assigned to the work of evangelists. And if he does that, and he does that faithfully, he deserves to be supported. And he's not your employee. He's not there just to do your bidding. He's not there to fill your pulpit for you. He's not there to get out and visit all your sick people. He may have more time to do that than you do because you work a secular job. And so, therefore, he may be a little more responsible than some people. But he's not there to do your work for you. That's a paid pastor system, and we don't believe in that stuff because the Bible doesn't teach that. An evangelist works with a congregation. An evangelist works to develop a congregation. He works among the congregation to get that church out and busy and preaching the gospel. And there's a partnership and there's a cooperation in all of that. Preachers are not hirelings. And you know what happens when a preacher becomes a hireling? He gets very interested in protecting his job. And protecting his job means he doesn't want to upset the apple cart. Protecting his job means he doesn't want to preach something that's going to make somebody uncomfortable. And there are some churches that they're concerned more about the numbers than they are about doing the will of God and being faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. 
Any preacher who comes here or anywhere else and works with a congregation, he is not here. He is not here to fill this building. He's here to fill this building. What I mean by that? He's here to fill your heart with the Word of God. To fill your heart with the truth. That's his charge. And he's not going to answer to you in the day of judgment for that. He's going to answer to God in the day of judgment for that. But when you have preachers without principles, you have great problems. And so this man, being a hireling, he tells the people what they wanted to hear. Now look down in chapter 18, beginning in verse 5. It says, so they said to him, please inquire of God that we may know whether the journey on which we go will be prosperous. And the priest said to them, go in peace. The presence of the Lord be with you on your way. Now they were about to go about, and I'm going to talk more about this again in just a moment. They were about to go about something that was very wrong. God was opposed to it. And they went to this priest and said, we want to know, will God approve of this? And without batting an eye, he said, oh, yes. Do as you see fit. God is going to bless you in this. And quite a story unfolds from that point forward. Keep in mind who they're asking. They're asking a priest who works in a shrine of idols. You talk about a case of the blind leading the blind. And he says, yes, God is with you. Go in peace. It's all good, but it wasn't fine, and it wasn't good. And I'll tell you, there are a lot of things that go on today that a lot of preachers may keep silent about. And it's not hard to find a preacher that will tell you it's all right. But that doesn't mean that it's all right. Sometimes there are 400 prophets that will tell you what, what you want to hear. And there's only one who will tell you what you need to hear. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned to fables. You know one of the reasons that so few people in the so-called church community respect the Bible today as the authoritative word of God is because for years they've been sitting under the breath of compromising milk toast and ambi pandy preachers on Sunday who don't leave the impression that the Bible is the word of God. And that it means what it says. Preaching for a job, preaching for popularity, prophesying for profit, ministering for mammon. And what the world and what the church need tonight are pure-hearted, Bible-convicted, soul-loving, sin-spurning men of God who stand on the thus saith the Lord. Men who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who are not ashamed of his truth. And men who love the word of God and who realize that they'll give an account for what they preach and for what they don't. And who realize that eternal souls hang in the balance. Open rebuke is better than secret love, the wise man said. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Paul asked in Galatians 4 and verse 16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 7 and 5, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. And there are multitudes of people who trudge to churches on Sunday to essentially hear the songs of fools. Hirelings preaching for their approval instead of God's, like this spineless priest of Micah who said, peace, peace, when there was no peace. So you had families without foundations, and you had preachers without principles, and as a result of all that, you had a culture without a conscience. Now back up to the first verse of chapter 18 and see how this all unfolds. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites was seeking an inheritance for itself to dwell in. For until that day, their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. So the children of Dan sent five men of their family from their territory, men of valor from Zoran, Eshdaol, to spy out the land and search it. They said to them, go search the land. So they went to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. And while they were at the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. And they turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What do you have here? And he said to them, Thus and so Micah did for me. He has hired me, and I have become his priest. Now what's this all about? Well, the people of the tribe of Dan, the leaders of the tribe of Dan, essentially said, uh, You know, we don't like what we have. They had not inherited and possessed the land that God intended for them to take and to possess. 
and because of their faithlessness and their uh, sin and their lack of direction. And so uh, they just set their eyes on a place that did not belong to them. Uh, they began to scheme and to plot to go down to this little defenseless city down here, way off in the middle of nowhere, this little town called Laish. And they thought, well, this little town, it's way off from anybody that could defend them. And, and uh, what they have is just right for the taking. And that wasn't God's will. That wasn't what God wanted them to do. But that's what they were going to do. And so they find this man, and they recognize him. And they said, what are you doing here? And he says, I, I, I'm Micah's priest. He has hired me. Uh, and they say, well, good deal. Inquire as to whether God will approve of this. And as I said, he tells them, yes, go on your way. God will bless what you're about to do. And they went on their way, and they plundered that city. And you want to talk about a hotbed of idolatry and sin? Uh, that's what it all came on. In fact, they came back after they went down and spied out this city of Laish and decided what they were going to do. And we're going to leave their hundreds of armed men down there and take it over. And they dominated that city. They went back there to the house of Micah where this priest was dwelling. And they began to sweet talk him. And they said, now if you were willing to work for Micah, it'd be much better if you'd just come down and work for us. Well, there wasn't any stopping back because he had no principles. They said, would you like to be a priest over a little house like this? Or would you like to be a priest over a big nation with a lot of people, a big tribe? And he says, oh, that sounds better to me. And so he goes, and they go in, and they just rob Micah blind. They just clean it all out, and they take all of his <coughs> idols and carved images, and they take it all down here to this city of Laish, and they set up an absolute shrine and hotbed of idolatry. All of that going on because there was no spiritual authority. Every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. And I'm telling you that when people abandon the word of God as their authority, when they abandon the word of God as their standard of right and wrong, whether it be as a culture, whether it be morally, whether it be in our li own lives spiritually, doctrinally, if you have a church that abandons the authority of the word of God and begins to do what it wants to do instead of what the Bible authorizes them to do, if you have a person who says, I'm going to live how I want to live and what God says about it really doesn't have anything to do with it, you are going to end up in a state of spiritual anarchy and spiritual confusion, just like you had in the days of the judges. And I won't go into it. In fact, it's a very, very graphic story. You want to find out how all this ended up? Read the last part of the book of Judges and one of the most horrible and gruesome and terrible stories recorded in the Word of God took place among that wicked culture of God's own people. Times. Now, before I close tonight, I've told you about the result of that philosophy. But I want to speak for just a moment about the reason behind all of this. Where did all of this come from? Notice it says, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did which was right in his own eyes. Now, actually, Israel had a king. Their king was God. God wanted to be their king, but they didn't respect God's laws and his rule, and they became a law to themselves. Now leave Judges and turn over to Romans chapter 1, and we'll finish with this. Because in Romans chapter 1, Paul shows us how the people of that day and the people of this day got into the trouble that we're in. Paul goes in Romans 1, even before the days of the Judges, and he gives a sad history, really, of the world. He gives a sad history of mankind. How the people lose their values and get so mixed up like our world is today. Well, just read Romans chapter 1 and you'll see how it happens. In fact, reading the first chapter of Romans almost seems like picking up a newspaper today and reading the modern headlines. Listen to what he says occurred here. He said, beginning of verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God, and that means God's way of making men righteous. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Then he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, the first thing that happens is a suppression of and an outright rejection of truth. Notice that Paul says they had truth. Notice he says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Not just those people who had the law of Moses, not just those people to whom God had directly spoken and given through Moses a law to keep, but all men. God judges all sin, and he judges all unrighteousness. And he says the unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That word hold means to suppress or to hold down, to withhold. In other words, they had the truth, but they didn't want it. And so they tried to silence it. He says that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know, even if a person never hears a gospel sermon, even if they never come to a service like this, they're still without excuse because God has left witness of himself in creation. God gives to every man a certain amount of knowledge of him. And what we do with that revelation or that knowledge determines whether or not God gives us more revelation. You see, this is not the only revelation of God. There is also a natural revelation of God. This is his supernatural revelation. But you know, this book was not written to people who don't believe in God. This book was not written to alien sinners out here. This book was written to people who already believe in God. The book that God wrote to people out here in this world to begin with is the book of nature. And that internal witness of conscience. And Paul says they had that. This ancient Gentile world, the nations of this world, they had that. All men have that. No matter if they live in some uh, far off, far flung, deserted place in this world or if they live in a, a place with a hundred churches. All men have that particular amount of revelation and that amount of light. But what do many people do with that? They suppress it. Why do they suppress it? They suppress it because of the implications of it. They don't want to accept it because if there is indeed a creator who made us in his image, then we're accountable to him. He's superior to us. And men do not want to submit themselves to the authority of God who tells them how to live who tells them what their moral, what their moral should be. And so they want to silence him. They want to get rid of him. And so the Bible says they held the truth in unrighteousness. They were willingly ignorant of the truth they were given. Well, what's the next step? Well, you're going to believe something. Everybody believes something. And so if they reject the truth, then they have to turn and believe something else. And therefore, Paul says in Romans 1, verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. In other words, they justified this repression or suppression of God's revelation. They justified this in their mind by saying, we don't need God. We're smart enough to explain all of this without God. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools fools. You know, our generation is a very foolish generation when you think about that. We think we are so intelligent. We are so educated. Some in our world would say we're so evolved. We're so advanced. We think man with all of this intelligence and all of this sophistication crawled out of a pool of slime billions upon billions of years ago and uh, finally grew two arms and two legs and a tail and sprouted hair and climbed up a tree and started swinging by his tail and eating bananas and that's your great great uncle Harry. Now that's a gross oversimplification. But in essence, that's what it amounts to. It amazes me today that people will laugh you to scorn for believing the Bible. People will think that you are some ignoramus who crawled out from under a rock somewhere if you actually believe that this is a book that came from God, that God exists, and that he has given us a book to live by and follow. They will laugh you to scorn to think that God created this world. 
But yet they can stand and they can advance all sorts of theories such as the multiverse theory and parallel universes and uh, life came to this earth by being seeded by aliens from outer space, never mind where that life would have come from. And, uh, you know, they, they, they defy some of the most basic axioms of science, such as the idea of abiogenesis, which means life only comes from life. You can't get life from non-life. We understand that. Uh, from nothing comes nothing. We understand that. But somehow they believe that out of nothing, at some point, they can't, under they can't understand it. They can't explain it. But at some point, something must have come from nothing. And out of this something developed something that had life, or life <coughs> began, and life evolved, and life became intelligent, and so on and so forth. I want to tell you something. I do not have enough faith. They believe all of that. Somebody wrote a book several years ago. It's been a very popular book. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I don't. But people take that seriously. You can stand up in a college classroom and advance just about any kind of harebrained theory you want to, and as long as it's not the Bible, as long as it's not Christianity, people will say, oh, this is interesting. Let us hear more. But the moment you start talking about the Bible, they don't want to hear it. Why don't they want to hear it? Because they don't want the restraint and authority of this book within their life. So professing themselves wise, they become fools. We think we're intelligent, but we don't even have a way of discerning between truth and error, right and wrong. You know, any politician will talk about values until someone asks whose values, and then he has to shut up. He gets shouted down. Whose values? Well, if you don't believe in the absolute authority of God and his word, uh, how do you answer that question? We live in a time where a baby owl or a baby reptile has more rights and more concerns shown about it than a human baby professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. We're living in a time now where uh, people don't know which restroom to go in in Target. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. My youngest daughter, Hallie, she was with me last time when I was here for a meeting. When she started kindergarten, she had an eye condition called intermittent, um, well, it's escaped me right off the top of my head, but it's long now. It's kind of like a lazy eye, not exactly the same thing, but she had a weak muscle in one of her eyes. And the doctor thought that they were going to <clears throat> have to correct that with surgery, but wanted to avoid that if they could. And so they said, what we're going to do instead is we're going to have her wear an eye patch for so many hours of the day over her good eye, and hopefully that will cause the other eye to compensate and strengthen that muscle, and maybe we won't have to do surgery. Well, they did end up having to do surgery, but uh, she was starting kindergarten. And so uh, it's kind of a cute thing. We sent her packing off to kindergarten the first day, looking like a pirate with a big patch over her eye, and we sent a note to the teacher. And we said, now, how are you supposed to wear this for so many hours? And if you'll just remind her, you know, at lunchtime or whatever time it was, that she can take this off. Now, does that sound like a big deal to you? No, we got a call from the school. And will you believe this? The school called us and they said, now, <clears throat> we cannot administer any kind of medical care without a signed note from a doctor. I thought that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. We're not talking about taking medicine here. We're not talking about surgery. We're talking about taking an eye patch off. But, you know, it's the day and time we're living in. So uh, we got the doctor had a note written out. And she went off school and everything's fine. She took her eye patch off. I say that, tell that to say this. Ironically, the same week that all that was going on, you know what one of the headlines in the news? That the federal government had come out and said that a teenage girl could receive counseling and a pill to induce an abortion, and her parents didn't have to be notified. We are living in a time where everything is upside down. People have lost their minds. Why? Is what Romans 1 says. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Why? Because it's anything but the truth. Anything but the Bible. Anything but God's Word. And it doesn't stop there. I've got to hurry. Religion was then hijacked. Look at verse 23. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man. And the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. What does that mean? Well, men by nature are going to worship. And so if he rejects the true God, he'll get a God of his own making. If he doesn't worship God, he'll make his own. He'll worship someone or something else. He turns to his idol. 
And we're living in a society today that's saturated in idolatry. What are our idols today? You say, oh no, idolatry was back in that old uh, archaic time where uh, they weren't as sophisticated, intelligent as we are today, and uh, we don't bow down to statues and things like that. Oh, really? Really? That kind of stuff still goes on all over the world today. It goes on in a few so-called Christian religions today. But you know what our idols really are today? Our idols are money and prestige and career and success and entertainment and movie stars and athletes and sporting teams, recreation, pleasure. Anything you love more, serve more, and give more to God, um, give more to that God, is an idol to you. Whatever you put in first place in your life, that becomes an idol. Then what happens? Hedonism. When God is cast aside, and this is the point of all of it, there's no more basis of morality and restraint. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Greed, gluttony, pleasure, immorality are the order of our day. We throw off the restraints. Anything goes and it's getting darker and it's getting worse. And then it moves to outright perversion. Verses 26 and 27, Paul describes that. And that agenda is now full-blown in this country today. And we're being bullied into saying that we approve of it. And if you don't, then you're the evil one. And you're full of hate. The tables have been turned. That's the culture we're living in. And I say all that to circle back to this. Unless you believe the Bible is the word of God and you stand on the authority, absolute, unchanging authority of God's word. You have no self-standing authority right now. You are adrift on a sea of subjectivity. And you will end up no kind of where, given what time. That's what has always happened to mankind. And that's what will happen to you. That's what's happening to our culture. And then it ends in the death of the conscience. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a depraved, reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The mind becomes reprobate, morally useless. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And sometimes he does so while he still claims to serve God, as it was in the days of the judges. So that's the result. I talked about the result of losing our values, the reason we lose our values. And as I close tonight, the response to these vanishing values. What do you do about families without foundations? I'll tell you what you do. You build your home on the bedrock of God's word. You make Jesus Christ and his lordship the centerpiece of your home and your life. You put your house on the bedrock of God's word and you saturate it in spirituality. Else the tide of tidal wave of postmodernism. Listen, don't just drill into your children's heads. This is true and this is not. This is right and this is wrong. Oh, you need to teach your children the things that are right, the things that are wrong. And I'm telling you, you've got to step beyond that. You've got to go before that. And what you've got to do is you've got to build within the heart of your child and the mind of your child a respect for God's word and a love for the Lord. You do, don't do that. You can tell them don't do this and don't do that all you want to, and they'll rebel against it. Put your family on the bedrock of God's Word. And what do you do about preachers without principles? Tell you what you do. You seek out preachers, Christians, and congregations who uphold the Word of God and won't compromise it. Yearn for men of God who will tell you what you need to hear, not just what you want to hear. And what do you do about a culture without conscience? You saturate your mind and heart with God's word and make it your moral and spiritual compass and guard your heart and your conscience and arm it with the word of God. As the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You've been patient. I'm not. If you're here tonight, you've never obeyed the gospel. Why don't you step out on the authority of God's word? Surrender to Jesus Christ. Allow him room in your heart to sit upon the throne of your heart submit to him yield to him in faith and repentance make the good confession tonight that you believe that Jesus is the son of God and as one already has today submit to being baptized in water for the remission of your sins as the Bible instructs the Lord will wash your sins away and he'll add them to the kingdom and we hope that you'll take those steps tonight as we together stand that's